Hello and welcome to my dungeon. Today I want to talk about how to approach creating NPCs that are actually useful to drive the story, to drive the plot of a sandbox scenario or drive the plot if you are outright writing a story. This is part two of me writing a death in space adventure and I've been working on plenty of examples to give later in the video. For the initial idea for any NPC, you can roll on some random tables and Death in Space has some of those, or you could use Stars Without Numbers, they also have good random tables for NPC generation, or you start with a character you like and then modify it to fit your setting, or you've got a role in the setting you have in mind, in the plot you have in mind, and you need an NPC to fill that role. And of course, sometimes inspiration can just hit you out of the blue when you're showering. For every NPC, I describe their appearance, their motivation, their secret, their dilemma, and their equipment. For the appearance, I want to be short and concise. And when you're just writing NPCs for your own home game, it's okay to put something in there like looks like Bruce Willis from 12 Monkeys and then at the table describe how you pictured Bruce Willis in 12 Monkeys. But if you are uh, writing an adventure for publishing or if you are writing a book, it pays off later if you at this point write down a few words, a few sentences of how a character looks. Try to be short and use words that are very expressive. Someone is lanky, for example, instead of just tall. Or someone got hungry eyes instead of just describing their color. This might not be a, a precise description of how the character actually looks, but it is invocative. It will bring up pictures of how that character could look in your audience's mind. Next up is motivation, which may be one of the most important parts of any character you create. What is their driving motivation? What do they live for? What do they strive toward? What do they want out of life? What do they want out of the situation you are throwing them in? If you are unsure what a character should do, always go back to the motivation. This motivation does not need to be exotic. It can be something very common, very relatable. Maybe someone just wants to earn money. And then you can elaborate on that. Someone just wants to earn enough money to get by. Or someone wants to earn enough money to finally retire. Or someone wants to earn money so he can send it back to his family. There are as many motivations as there are humans in the world, I suppose. But I usually try to go for something relatable, something that I can relate to myself. That makes it easier to picture that character in your head and try to think like that character when you need to decide what that character will do next. Then we got a secret. I give every of my characters a secret because I think that makes characters just more interesting, gives them more depth does not need to be a big secret or a damning secret. It can be as simple as someone has a crush on someone else or someone always feels insecure, though they present a very boastful, extroverted persona outwards. But of course, you can put big, damning secrets in there. And in my experience, the characters with the bigger secrets tend to become more important in the story. Next, we've got the dilemma. The dilemma is a challenge that the character can't overcome themselves. It usually follows as a combination of their motivation and the world around them and their secret. But it helps spelling that dilemma out. It's the major challenge that that character will face in the story and for an RPG. It is the challenge that these NPC could potentially use the player's help for. Last but not least, we've got the equipment. And we put the important pieces in here. 
the tools they have at their disposal to face challenges and overcome problems. Also put a little personal trinket in there, actually inspired by the personal trinket table of the Death and Space character creation. And I found that giving each character one of this gave me more insight into the personality of these characters. And then it inspired me to go back and overthink their motivations and their secrets and make little adjustments. So, in a way, these useless trinkets became the most important part of the equipment. Now, enough theory crafting. Let me show you what I came up with for the adventure. For this adventure, I came up with three important NPCs for every location, but also with two wild cards that might later become three wild cards as well. These wild cards can appear at any of the three adventure locations and help you link the three locations together if you want to run a small campaign with these. First up we have Cero Candela or Zero Candela or Cero Candela who is uh, who is the captain of the TTO crew that goes to the asteroid or goes to the planet and might come into contact with the players there. Since TTO is a void cult, I made this here leader a, a void, spindly void clad in ragged robes, features hidden behind a mask in the shadows of a white hood. Synthesized unspecific voice. To come up with this name, I searched for a unit of darkness, but because there is no unit for darkness, darkness is just the absence of light. But the SI unit for light is Candela. So zero Candela would be absolute darkness. Then I did a little bit of lead speech on zero to make it look less like just a number, though this here is the number zero instead of the letter O. As you can see, I tried to be invocative rather than specific with the appearance. Their motivation is further the agenda of the endarkened TTO faction. Collect void-touched artifacts and knowledge about the void which gives them motivation to act on each of the three adventure locations. Secrets. No one knows their real face, voice, age or name. So far so good, but I thought there could be a bit more. Zero has given all of that up to become close with the void. By now, even they don't remember anymore. And their dilemma follows from their secret that comes into conflict with the wider setting and that is that they can't appear out in the open and reveal TTO as a void cult. So they have to act from the background, most often stay on the ship and use their equipment to act through the radio and, and act through their subordinates. So I've got a few stats here that also gave each leader of the TTO faction a cosmic mutation. And rather than just take a cosmic mutation from the book, I thought, hey, I want to publish this professionally. I should put a bit more work into this and come up with new cosmic mutations. I didn't much care for balance on this. I wanted them to fit the theme of the character. But if they are imbalanced, it's not a huge problem because these are just powers that an NPC has. So Zero here has absorb energy. They can absorb energy from anything they touch and take it into themselves as sustenance. This heals 1d4 HP. This also does 1d3 damage. This should be d4 as well. 1d4 damage to a creature or depletes the energy of a device, rendering inoperable until reloaded or recharged. And I think this would be really creepy if you're putting a gun to the head and they touch it and 
the energy just goes to zero and can't be fired anymore. Any situation like that, that's definitely a void touch power. For the most important equipment, they've got the void mask that the uh, void backgrounds gets. Also a voice synthesizer that can fake their voice. And their personal trinket is a laser disc of Ogre Veil songs. But Ogre Veils hibernate frozen in solid ice. So it's just 52 minutes of total silence. To command around, Zero has a TTO crew, four TTO members, I might adjust that number later. Carbons and punks that look like miners or salvage crews from MMC. So TTO can act without revealing that they are void cold. They're just pretty much standard space goons here. And this crew also needed a ship, the TTO spaceship, the Merry Death, a mining hauler. I had some fun with the lead speech here. And you might want to introduce this as the M3RY-D43TH and then wait a minute until your players write it down and realize that it spells out Merry Death. From the outside it looks like an MMC asteroid mining ship, but it hides a void shrine where secret void rituals can be held and void artifacts can be safely transported. So if you were to go on that ship and speak with them, you wouldn't initially notice, but if they were to capture you and try to do some void stuff in their secret ritual chamber with you, or if you were to or if you were to take over and search the ship, you would find this Void Shrine and find out that something is going on with MMC and Void Cults. And I used a base ship from the Core Worlds and modified it slightly. So this has an upgraded uncommon drive, a diamagnetic fusion reactor, making it fast so they can just run away from most trouble if they have to and gave them some modules that I think will be useful for the mission. So a cargo bay, a driller echo which lets them scan the interior of an asteroid or ship, the hidden void shrine, a modified asteroid drill that can be used for boarding actions and a UAV system with two surveillance drones and two drilling drones. So that should be interested when they come into conflict with the players and their ship and the ship of the other crew that will be at the asteroid. Second wildcard character is Bo Rover. The character I came up with as a contract giver when playing Welcome to the Iron Ring with my group. And him I just rolled up from the NPC tables and elaborated a bit. So he's a middle-aged carbon, still wearing an often patched flight suit. Though he can't close the front anymore over his growing belly. Always snacking on something. Friendly guy who is speaking with big gestures and flowery language. Motivation. Make Holo's connection and improve his reputation as a broker. This is a pretty straightforward character. Secret. If there is a conflict, he is secretly working for either side to make more hollows. But if this were to came out, it would ruin his reputation. Dilemma. Is not as young as he used to be anymore and maybe has five good years of his life left before his manufactured carbon biology catches up to him. So this just gives you a bit of insight in what kind of a man Bo Rover is. Some stats, nothing special. Equipment, tablet computer, pheromone spray, I don't even know what that does. Holographic playing cards and as a trinket, a flight suit patch with frayed edges from one hawk. Doesn't say anywhere who hawk was, maybe it was Bo's own call sign. Maybe it was a call sign of his wingman or something. But it adds a little bit of flavor to Bo Rover. 
For location one, the asteroid, I mainly had to come up with a rivaling crew for the players that is also going for the asteroid for this, for Neumann probe. And because other than that, there aren't many NPCs around, I decided to flesh out three NPCs just in this crew. This also gives the players the opportunity to play the different members of this crew against each other when they come into conflict with them. Furthermore, you have the uh, wildcard crew that can also turn up on this location to complicate things. So this is the crew of the Ericsson. Since this is a salvage crew, I wanted to have some names that were reminiscent of salvage. And since Death in Space is a Swedish role-playing game, I was reminded of the tale of Life the Lucky Ericsson, who was a famous Viking who came into fame and fortune because he came across an abandoned ship on the open sea. So he got rich from salvage. And that inspired the whole crew somehow. So the captain is called Lucky rather than Life. I thought that Life was a bit on the nose. So he's just lucky. He's a gray bearded solo pod with bright blue eyes and a winning smile. That might actually be a bit short yet. Motivation. Find out what is up with the asteroid and make the most profit from it, be it from salvage or information. As greed is a returning theme in this adventure, this is the primary motivation for the crew has survived more than a dozen crews in his long life. He's a solo pod after all. And he has trouble relating to people, as you would have if everyone around you ages and dies while you are asleep. And his friendliness is only a facade. This leads to his dilemma. Behind his back, his crew calls him unlucky. If he does not bring them a huge share of hollows soon, they will put him back into his solopod and space him through the airlock. So Lucky is really driven to make a huge profit from this asteroid. Then equipment, portable hibernation pod, heavy EVA suit, duct tape, a fusion welder and a platinum wedding ring on a silver necklace. So this guy was married once, but in his long solo pod life at some point he has survived his partner maybe that was what drove him to become a solo pod in the first place next crew member blue uh, because another famous viking is king bluetooth which the uh, mobile phone bluetooth standard is named after this bluetooth symbol this rune that is king harold Bluetooth's rune. So blue is of course just a nickname. It's a blue haired twin punk. So a 20 something punk. Lanky and neat of a wash. Wears traditional non-confirmist attire. Which amuses me a little. But you have to remember that punks in this setting look back on a millennia long history. And I actually have no idea what traditional non-confirmist attire looks like in Death in Space. It's whatever the GM makes of it, I guess. Or whatever each player you describe this to imagines it to be. Motivation. She wants to make a mark on the world. She is still young and eager and show everyone what she can do. Secret. She has no idea what she is doing. And she has a crush on Lucky. So this is a pretty benign secret, but it informs you about her character. And it becomes important for the crew dynamic of the Ericsson. Then her dilemma. The crew is getting disillusioned with Lucky. She's got a crush on him. And she does not know how to keep up morale. Comes over as harsh and aggressive but is actually insecure. Some stats, equipment, 
light EVA is suit. This is a salvage crew, so every one of them should have access to an EVA suit. Then spray paint, a boom box with solar panels and a crank, so you can use it anywhere, and a broken drumstick. Then we've got Sony. Now after Bluetooth, I was thinking about uh, mobile phones. And there was a Finnish or Swedish phone company, I believe, called Ericsson, that later was bought by Sony and became Sony Ericsson. I think they went out of business when smartphones became a thing. Anyway, that's where Sony's name comes from, from Sony. I just didn't want to put Sony in there, so it's Sony. And he's a nerdy punk teenager wearing hacked rectangular smart glasses, has ripped off the left sleeve of his overall to show off his first tattoo, an anarchy A. So, so you can get the impression that this guy is just trying way too hard. Motivation. Make enough follows and gain enough reputation to buy his own ship. Which is a good dream to have for a teenager. And get Blue's attention. This is setting up a little bit of a love triangle within the crew of the Ericsson that the players might exploit. This is, of course, a silly idea, but it's a very human thing that in this vast cosmos with aliens and black holes, still the driving motivation is something as small and silly as love. Secret has a crush on Blue, hates Lucky because Blue has only eyes for the old spacer. And that all informs his dilemma. Actually, everyone knows about his crush. Remember, he is a teenager. He is not good at hiding his feelings. The crew are taking bets with the odds 10 to 1 that she will reject his advances if he ever works up the courage to ask her out. Then equipment, toolbox, light EVA suit, tablet computer, a full set of gaming dice, corners rounded with age. So you could sit down and play around of Merkborg with this guy. Then we've got a bit of unnamed crew, just so there are more of them, a ragtag bunch of punks and carbons that are out to make quick buck, six in total. Finally, a description of the ship. Once again, just generated a ship with the core rules. A century-old light freighter, held together with duct tape and guts, modified for salvage missions. So nothing special here. Cargo bay, hydroponic farm, space dock, and hull grapplers. Everything you need to take apart and haul home salvage. Location 2 is where I think things really got interesting, because this is Lepidop Terra, the planet with the alien ruins on it. First NPC are actually two NPC. Want to have a pair of archaeologists that are excavating the alien ruins on this planet. And when I was making the other characters, I was reminded that they are carbons, sentient, century-old AIs in biological bodies. And combining that from some characters from a science fiction novel I recently read, I think it was, can't remember from the top of my head. Combining that with those characters, Tersi became a pair of hairless androgynous chromes with perfectly designed bodies. One of them looks vaguely male, the other vaguely female. Motivation. This is where I actually put some more description to so all of this makes sense. They are actually only one person, an AI that has been placed in several bodies, but they all share the same mind. Tersi is fascinated by history, especially if that history is unknown. They were the ones that proposed the Conbina expedition on Lepidoptera and are officially the leader of this expedition. But mainly, they want to explore the ancient ruins in the jungle and discover its history and secrets. Their secret, Tursi used to have 2,000 bodies, but they lost all but two of them in 
carelessness and foolhardy risk taking and also in the war because here down in the equipment you can see uh, for the personal trinket i came up with a holographic image of a huge ship crew gathered in a carrier's flight hangar who all look similar all of them were tersey at some point but now only two of them are left and their motivation their secrets and their surroundings once more informs their dilemma the iron storms on Lepidoptera are interfering with the communications between the bodies they have to stay inside the faraday cage during solar storms or risk desynchronizing from one another becoming separate individuals which might become interesting if i introduce some rogue solar flares during the scenario or some other phenomenon that would cut off their radio communications maybe if you put one of the bodies in the faraday cage or one of the bodies off world what would happen then equipment 10 for extreme weather planetary cooking kit archaeological equipment medical grade epoxy everything you need to do an archaeological dig then some unnamed conbina expedition members 12 scientists focused on botany zoology and genetics furthermore we've got lance raider the security chief grizzled veteran with scarred face and sour disposition a mass-produced carbon soldier heavily tattooed on face and body to gain individuality dark rings around her yellow wolfish eyes motivation get paid this is about greed once again get off this black hellhole keep the suicidal stupid scientists alive this pretty no-nonsense security advisor motivation secret is addicted to peas peas are sleep pills from the addictive substance table in the core books needs them to be able to sleep at all and that informs her dilemma her supply of peas has run out and she has not slept in days which explains the dark rings around her eyes and will probably make her really disagreeable and lead to her making costly mistakes equipment heavy carapace armor tripwire flares a fake grenade and a box filled with old dog tags also thought i should give her rifle some names so this is uh, l and m manufacturing r7p rifle rather than just using the name riot rifle and she is leading the conbina security team because you can't just place 12 scientists on a hostile jungle and expect them to survive so Convina sent with them a security team and in addition to lands we have two hired mercenaries veterans from the gem war with shotguns or flamethrowers because in the ideas i wrote down that they use flamethrowers to burn back the vegetation that is encroaching on the camp and then i had some fun i wanted to have an alien race some hunter gatherers some tribal aliens that lived in the forest near the ruins and i had not yet come up with how these aliens actually look what they are but i decided to make them npcs and treat them as persons rather than monsters so this is smells like fallen leaves on a rainy day these aliens don't use spoken language like we do they have a language of pheromones of smells and of touch so this is what her name would translate to ghostly anthropods with transparent sheet and carapace and alien beauty standing on four spindly legs with the forearmed torso upright like a centaur no eyes long feather-like feelers on the forehead delicate mandibles so i was thinking of 
an insectoid race and anthropods mostly uh, small crustaceans that live in the deep ocean or in caves where no light ever reaches don't have any pigment in their carapace and if you take that to the extreme it might become transparent in the surroundings of the black forests of Lepidoptera, I think that would look really scary, really haunting actually. And on now this is mostly general description of the Lepidopteran ghosts, but here's uh, the personal description. Smells like fallen leaves, is a bit larger than the rest of the hunters, with a thick abdomen and intricate, endlessly spiraling and knotting patterns are carved into a carapace. Upon seeing these, you should quickly notice that these are not mindless animals. These are a people with culture and customs and language, however alien that all might be. Motivation. She's the leader of a hunting bed of Lepidopteran ghosts, species of blind sapient anthropods that live in a tribal hunter-gatherer society wants to find out what is going on in their hunting grounds and come back to her village with ample food, precious metal scraps and all of her hunters alive. Will want to investigate the humans and if these humans are dangerous to her tribe. If they are friendly, she wants to warn them about the dangers of the runes. So this is the longest motivation I wrote down for any of the characters. I thought that for the strange alien race that I came up with just for this adventure, I needed to put a bit more description into it to convey what they're all about. Secret. He has recently stolen a portion of the mother's jelly and morphed to be fertile. Takes great care to keep the scent hidden while she gingerly feels out who she can trust with this. So if this came out, it would be a huge problem for her. Maybe see her banished, maybe killed. And it could be a motivation to seek out the help of the player characters. This all is of course informing the dilemma. To be a children of her own, she has to leave the tribe behind and form her own. For that, she needs a male or at least his seed. And I think depending on how you run your adventures and the players you have, this could become really strange and she might even end up on the player's ship. I don't know. That is something that happens with my players at least. But what this all informs is that this is not just an alien monster out to eat you. This is a person with their own culture, struggles and motivation. Equipment. Spear and shield, a net, hunting and trapping tools and a silk rag doll. The ghost equipment is made from wood, chitin, silk and scrap metal. Intricate patterns pleasing to the touch are woven or carved into pieces of equipment or even the carapace of the hunters themselves. So a bit more description than for the other NPCs, but I'm describing a new alien culture here, so I thought I should give some additional detail. And she's traveling with seven hunters. The seven hunters travel silently and are not encumbered by darkness or fooled by optical camouflage. They're blind after all. Their sense of smell and touch are incredibly acute. They communicate via pheromones and touch. They make loud clicking noises when they need to call out at a distance. And I fear I will actually have to draw one of these hunters, which will certainly be a challenge for one with my little artistic skill. Last location. This is the Colts space station, the mining outpost. So I've got some faction leaders for the different TTO factions here starting with Nihil Ingentin. After creating uh, Cero and the Merry Death, I thought that this is just a thing that at least the Endarkened faction does. They put 
numbers in the name for some reason. Nihil in Gentin means nothing, nothing. So Nihil should be Latin and in Gentin should be Swedish for nothing, if my research is right. She's true void cultist's appearance. Tall, lithe void. Her alluring figure and white hair hidden under flowing black robes of shiny synthetic silk. I've got three voids in this adventure and I wanted to give each of them a distinct appearance and personality, even though they are all just wearing black robes. Motivation. Seek deeper understanding of the void and spread the message of absolute nothing far and wide. Strengthen the Endarkened faction. So this is a proper cult leader. One who is believing in what she is preaching. Secret. Has been to the edge of space and seen the void. So she's a true Endarkened. Found the otherworldly experience of true nothingness to be a revelation. Her true goal is for all existence to vanish into the void, which is not the stated goal of the TTO faction at large. So this informs her dilemma and brings her into conflict with the rest of the world and the rest of her faction. Has yet to exist, spread the word and work to make her dream of non-existence come true. Only in drug-induced unconsciousness does she find bliss. So this is a proper nutcase cultist. I wanted her and her ideas to be alluring and tempting. If not from the ideas themselves, then by her sheer looks and force of personality. That's why she's got the savvy stat at plus four, which is one above the maximum for starting characters. That's really high in death space. She also doesn't have a proper weapon. She just has an injector for antifreen, which is a paralyzing poison, a nerve agent. And because of that, I gave her the special weapon and special ability that she has to hit in melee and attack with dex to use this rather than using her weak body stat. As a TTO leader and a void, she also gets a cosmic mutation and hers is radio silence. Can create a zone of five meter radius in which all photons cease to exist. This includes the whole spectrum of electromagnetic waves including radio waves, visible light, and gamma rays. So a darkness spell is nothing against this. This will not only make it so you can't see anything, it will also put all of your electronic equipment, all of your radio devices out of commission. Equipment. Single-use restore injection, 1d4 doses of kype gel and ansifrine. So she's only carrying drugs. And I will make it so in the later description that the Endarkened faction is controlling the production and the trade of drugs on the station. So in that context, this will make total sense. And because she is a true nihilist, she has no personal trinkets whatsoever. She's given all of that up. Second leader is Bortom Orda, which means beyond the edge. And I've forgotten which combination of languages I used for this. He is a stocky void, his thick frame hidden under robust aromatic polyamide ropes. So this is aramide fibers, similar to Kevlar fibers, bulletproof ropes basically. Diagrams and calculations of exotic geometry play on his screen-like mask. So as I said, I've got three voids and I wanted them all to look distinct and even all of their robes to look distinct. Motivation. To find the spark of life in the void beyond the four-dimensional borders of the current universe. Get more resources, members, material and knowledge for the constructs. So this is in line with the overall 
goal of the TTO cult from the core rules. Secret has only seen the void in zero Q type induced simulations and dreams. True understanding yet eludes him and he finds no solutions for the jump calculations to the beyond he is constantly running. So he is a cultist, but he is also an engineer and he is approaching this problem from a perspective of science and engineering and he is finding no solutions. That's why the TTO faction is increasingly going towards superstition and ritual and religion rather than science. Dilemma. Because he is a natural leader and inspired engineer, he finds himself as the local leader of the constructors, pushing an agenda he is doubting himself. So he is a religious leader, even though he is doubting himself and his beliefs and the religion. Jai find his an interesting internal struggle. But this also means that his worldview can be changed. Maybe he can be endarkened to seek another path. He of course also got a cosmic mutation and his one is supercomputer. Can run complex simulations in his head. Don't know what the practical applications would be of this, but it would certainly help in his work. A computer built into his visor, flying mini drones, a flying mini drone, a battery, and as a personal trinket, a necker cube. If you don't know what that is, look it up. I put it in here as kind of a joke, but it makes sense for this character. Final NPC, the third NPC on the third location is Jaspred Hobo, the representative of the Stahlwerket Union. He's a thick middle-aged punk with a shaggy black beard, hiding his bald head under a black turban. We are sustained orange overall with stark verket patches. So this is just a relatable working class guy. Motivation. Get promoted to be a functionary so he can bring back more hollows to his family and finally go on a holiday came up with this holiday idea and him being overworked and tired when I was working out his trinket, which become a holographic sapphire falls postcard. I thought why would he keep a postcard of a holiday destination with him at all times? Because he really wants to go on holiday. So his secret he is in his midlife crisis. He always wanted to be a galaxy ranger and bring justice with blazing guns, but now he is a professional union member trying to recruit more union members on a non-union space station and is wondering what he did wrong to end up in this situation. Dilemma. No one is listening to him and he can't figure out why. If he fails this assignment, he can kiss his promotion at you and his husband might divorce him. So this middle-aged guy in his midlife crisis is in conflict with the cult and the cult might decide to silence him or maybe pay him off. But it also might be possible to recruit him into the cult. And I think that is important when you're designing NPCs for a sandbox scenario such as this, that there are many potential ways these NPCs and the players could interact and many potential outcomes for the challenges, problems and conflicts that the scenario is presenting. Anyway, that's all I have for today, folks. If you're still watching, consider liking and subscribing to my channel. More videos of the creation of this adventure will come. As always, thanks for watching and until next time.